just like them to give us feedback if there's any sound problems that we can attend to it. And then secondly, we just to remind you again, we have another last one tomorrow morning, which will be at TUT uh, main campus, but we'll also have another one uh, streaming live so on YouTube. I will also encourage you to ask questions. If you are here or you're also on YouTube, please drop us a question on the chat and we will have a look and see if we can attend to some of those questions. But yeah, I will ask uh, Al Stratford to continue giving us um, um, more of his wisdom, especially on his work on the Sophia, the work of President of the Sophia. Good evening everybody and thank you for coming tonight. Um, what I'm presenting tonight is what I presented in uh, 2016 at, this, at the Sophia Gray Memorial Lecture in Bloemfontein. Uh, I think I was number 32, so every year for the past, well, even since then, there have been more people that have presented their work in South Africa, architects in South Africa. So this first slide is just to make you aware of my roots and this is the farmhouse where I grew up and the two highlighted people are my parents and we lived in a very rough environment and you can see that building is made out of brick and offshot of concrete and my father was a builder and he built that farm from scratch to a large extent. So when I was about uh, five years old they built a bedroom for me, and that's the bedroom in the garden, okay, which is a little hut. And it's, uh, you'll also see behind that in the garden some flowers, and that's how my mother used to pay for me to go to school, by selling flowers. And so that was my bedroom, and the guy next to me with the orange jersey is my cousin, he's like my brother. And so I had this very interesting background of growing up in a simple environment, and in particular, this is a very sustainable building, okay? It's so sustainable, it's not there anymore. <laughs> uh, it has melted back into the ground. And that's the beauty of this simple structure. Very cheap to build, very warm in winter, and cool in summer, well insulated, and so it performs very well. These are further photographs, and you can see some of my first Perhaps architectural intervention here, yeah, I used two dumb boots and a hat to build some sort of little structure. This is the wagon that went over my head one day and I've never recovered. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately it had uh, rubber tires and this is one of the early drawings that I did. Just excuse me. <coughs> so I started a new artwork and pencil drawings uh, at an early stage in my life. And then when I was 22 uh, years old, I went out and started to build houses. And this house I built, I didn't design it. <coughs> I built it in 1960, um, it would have been 1960, I'm to think of that, in 1973, when I built that house, which is 50 years ago. Eh? It's quite modern and uh, I used the, these are the built-in cupboards, so I expressed them externally on the building and then this is the fireplace and we had a sea view from this window so it's right down on the beach and uh, worked very well in that sense. I then worked, went to work in Durban in a multidisciplinary practice and so this guy is from Poland, the Polish architect. This is a South African, you can see the way he's dressed, okay? <laughs> and this is a guy from Britain, and yeah, I haven't even got a shirt on. So I've been working very hard and building this model. This is a housing competition, Mitchell's Plain, that I did back then with these people. <coughs> I was working in this building over here, and if you look at that, you'll understand the roots of that is the Corbusier, off the shutter concrete, and then I also worked uh, in this little building, which was owned by the building design group, Paul Mikula, was in that building. 
I'll use this just to illustrate a very famous architect, Miss Honoro. And he said a chair is a very difficult object, a skyscraper is almost easier. So I think that's worth knowing, okay, because furniture is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and it's, it's worth knowing that it is a very difficult thing to do. So I started to do furniture back then. There is my eldest son who is now an architect. And this is knocked down furniture. It fitted together with Allen keys. And we did the pipe bending and this is canvas stretched between it. And this is some of the first furniture that I started doing back then. Also, lounge suites and those were made in a modular way. And each one of these was a box and you could put these cushions inside the box. And it's made it very easy to transport those and to and to sell them in that way. So you could buy it in a modular way. So the armrest and the backrest was a common feature and then the, the seat box was a common. So this is really two major elements to the piece of furniture. I'm also very impressed by the work of Oscar Niemeyer. And here you'll see some of the reference to his work in Brasilia. And that color is now fashionable again. Perhaps that burnt orange it used to be called back then. I don't know what we call it now, but um, that's a little house that I built in Durban um, in 1974. <coughs> I designed this church for the missionary organization, the Baptist Missionary Organization in Mandini, Sundimbuli, which is up on the north coast of uh, Palazzolo Natal. And a little steel structure uh, with a lattice girder and uh, Five cement roofs, but nobody liked the building. They said this doesn't look like a church. Even the cross didn't help. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't liked by the end user. It didn't have a reference. And I think that's a lot of the problems with um, with modern architecture. It left behind the reference, and so we had the the, the uh, postmodern architecture came which back went back to referencing to history. <coughs> I returned to East London in 1980, and this is the house that I built, and I can show you the aerial photograph of this. And on this building, I invented the, the concrete windows, and yeah, you can see them on the elevation there. And then as I went around the building, they actually got bigger, uh, up to 500 by 500. And so the whole building was on a panhandle site. This is the handle running in this direction, and that is due north. That's the garage. And so I had a bedroom in there and a living room in there. This is an outdoor courtyard area. And a very simple little building, only uh, 4,8 meters wide uh, in terms of that width there on the internal dimension. And uh, that became my home in 1918 and also the first windblock building to be built in South Africa. <coughs> so these are the guys that I built with, just off the street, I own a built and uh, had a very interesting time with them. Uh, lovely building in these elements. Yeah, you can see them here. They were a bit different back then. And this is the main passage for the bedroom wing. We made it wide so we could put desks along this side here. So it became a service passage to the bedrooms on the right hand side. And the main ensuite was through that doorway there. <coughs> so in the lounge area, this is this is the lounge. I had a mezzanine floor there. And here you can see the stepped inverted cigarette um, upside down pyramid uh, became my desk. So that is my little studio upstairs. This is the dining area and the kitchen is on the left. The main entrance into the building went through a pivoting gate and you'll see these gun poles. They are fixed against a slab there and they are suspended by a stainless steel cable. So here you can see them floating through the air. There's a cable attached there and it hangs as a catenary. And the little cables hanging down to each pole. And in that way, we had a very simple flat cover for the motor cars that were parked over there. So having done the wind block, I then went ahead and looked at how to create a business. And this was the beginning. Uh, of defining what the wind block was. I defined the, the, the problems of the traditional windows and then 
how we could actually make a, a concrete masonry unit, put a hole through it, uh, and a rebate to, to handle the fixed glass. And so you can see this section is a bit different here. We put the glass against that. Instead of having a rebate, we had an upstand there. So it resulted in a very broad concrete edge, visually on the inside of the building. So this was the initial concept. And this is the patent application. This is the, the uh, extract, the abstract for the whole patent. And that was done in 1981. If you have a product that goes into the building industry, you've got to make sure that it works. <laughs> and so the loading had to be applied to that. And if you can understand, this is the type of loading that we did. This is the mortar. And we had a load being concentrated on the one edge because that's where the concrete slab would sit if it was sitting on the wall. And so we were able to concentrate the load on the one edge and then load it until it failed. And the thing that actually failed is the mortar, not the concrete. So the mortar fails because it's too soft. And uh, But we were able to then use these to do double story classrooms with continuous windlock wall windows uh, that would take that loading. Here you can see the failure mode and crushing happening after the mortar goes. The bottom flange stayed up and the main load coming down the vertical mullions as we call them was then concentrated on the mortar and that's how it failed. So in that way we were able to determine the loading that the product could handle. <coughs> And then went on to build another house, and here you can see a bay window happening. And this was the second building to be built with it, and that's an internal shot of it. I want you just to remember that because I'm going to show you another slide at the end, which is a reference back to that one. And there we made little timber windows, and we were talking about them today. And had a simple hinge at the top and a peg stay to keep them open, and we glued them in with epoxy. And epoxy is very brittle and it can't handle the differential movement between timber and concrete. And so the time came when we went and we took the pegstay and we pushed it and the whole window fell out. <laughs> and you'd have to pull it back using the brass pegstay. So the epoxy didn't work in that context and then we changed to silicons later on. So that is that little house uh, as it is today. And that is some postmodern references here, flat Doric columns, which we cast out of concrete, and uh, that is now a little bit business in the city. I then went on to build a church here in Edenvale, so this was the, the first major building, I designed it in 82, uh, you can see the date there, 82, and uh, that's the building. And first building up in Johannesburg to use the windlock. And so what I did was I differentiated the brickwork from the frame structure by using the, the windlock as a trim around the wood brickwork. So the building had a laminated timber type of structure and we used those points as springing points the structure to be attached and we also had some tension cables going through the building to take the horizontal thrust because as that loading came down it tend to push and so that's how we handled the loading in the building. There you can see those capitals and I went to site one day and they had just put those capitals on without orientating them correctly. They were already cast and I said, uh, uh, we'll have to chop those off and get them to be orientated in the plane of the wall, otherwise it couldn't receive uh, these members. Yeah, they were octagonal in plan, and I actually had the moulds made for that as well. So you've very often got to assist your builder in doing what you're doing. Because if he had to make a mould for that, it probably wouldn't have looked anything like that. So I had the moulds made. And that was my first introduction to mould making uh, for precast concrete, in this case, in situ concrete. Obviously, I've made the moulds for the wind block prior to that. <coughs> I went on then to build a little community hall, very simple building in East London on a farm, with a pinery 
for the pine industry, pineapple industry. And here you can just see some sort of example of the detailing of how it's all put together. And then I did a development of six townhouses by consolidating uh, three sites and putting semi-detached units onto that. And uh, built models out of plywood and X-ray uh, plates for the windows, you probably know the story, and sandpaper for the roof. And then I launched Windblock with this graphic design, and this is the original cover. Also, we won a national award uh, with the South African Bureau of Standards, their design institute, gave us a national award in 1988. And uh, very soon architects were using it. This was a building in Durban. This is perhaps the longest use of Windrock that I'm aware of, designed by Hans Hallen, Hallen Toronto Partners in Durban. And so you see it going into, this is Magnus University of Technology now. Uh, you see it going into low cost housing as well and into upmarket, and this is a church and this is a factory. The different types of application for the Windrock system. From a marketing point of view, we put out what we call the WinTech window which was a window on what we were doing and making great openings for you and we started to make wooden windows as well once again and uh, this is part of our marketing information. We also did the structural panel sizes for wind loading and also the solar cutoff angles at different latitudes and uh, I think we are around about uh, in Johannesburg is 30 degrees south, we about 34 down in East London. I'm not too sure, yeah, that's about where it is. So these are just drawings of some of the industrial design stuff that I did. This is done on, this is hand drawings, and this is the section through the mold and how to make it, and what to do in terms of welding. And then this is the hinge that we developed for the opening windows. Instead of riveting those hinges fast, we in fact crimp them with into the aluminium. So in that way we cut out drilling all the holes and buying rivets and everything that, that goes with So the, the window then had a fixed hinging device. And this is the section fluid in the other direction. And these are the extrusions that I spoke about this morning. Um, and uh, these type of extrusions are held together with a corner cleat that goes into that position there and the friction stay, the opening hinge goes into that space. And these spaces are the gaskets which seal off the airflow. And uh, so that is the original universal section that I designed in about 1987. <coughs> so architects started to use, and here you can see quite a contrast used in a very uh, unpainted, this is painted, Throughout South Africa, we started to get use of windblock. This is up in Johannesburg. Uh, another long wall, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 4.2 meters high by ever long, that's 600 modules. And if you count quickly, you'll see how long that is. So it's a long wall, and that is perhaps the best way because it makes more money in my company. <laughs> but it also is a very strong element in, in the design side. And it does a lovely job of screening the interior as well. <coughs> we held a national competition for the use of Windblock. And uh, this is Alfred Prune in uh, Durban. This is Chico Morales in Cape Town. And here you can get some sort of idea of how the concrete floor and the elements of the building are actually born on top of the Windblock library structure. This is back to Mangasutu. University of Technology, uh, Hans Allen's building. Yeah, you'll also get an understanding of it used in a load bearing capacity, the whole load coming down on that on those wind blocks there, the gable end of the building. This is using it in a more conventional way. Yeah, you can see we've got the rectangular ones as well, not only square ones, so we've been renting with different sizes and different shapes. We also developed a much bigger window and uh, we don't continue with that anymore, but part of it then became a shop front as well. 
because coffee chocolate. So the product picked up on the postmodern push in architecture. It became very much a, a noddy type of toy that architects could use. And uh, perhaps used in a noddy type of building as well, I might say. With pediments and all sorts of things. And I hope the architect that did this isn't watching what I'm saying tonight. <laughs> um, but they went in all over South Africa. This is near Mpumalanda. This is at Kruenstadt, it's the uh, municipal swimming pool, once again used as a shading device uh, for the interior of the building. This is, is a furniture shop in Durban. And you can see that you can actually also lay them in plan on a circle. You don't have to go flat, you can actually take them around the corner. Each one is a facet of the radius of the circle. <coughs> you might have heard of hand spring puppets, don't you know about them? This was their home, designed by Nicholas Sack in Johannesburg before they became internationally famous. And uh, this was done in about 1990, I think it was. <coughs> so to get back to furniture, I have loved doing chairs and so I developed this piece of furniture for a competition that we had in South Africa. And there it is, in, it's a rimpy stool uh, with a bit of a swing to it. So in actual fact, the seat acts as a, a compression arch and gives the structural loading <coughs> back down into the floor. <coughs> Excuse me. slide this morning. <coughs> <coughs> and this is the subliminal back of the mind influence that I had in developing the staircase, which we, which we, we trademarked as wind step. And with that system you can build stairs, you can build bridges or ramps. So to produce that, and we also had it all, all the structural load bearing test done. <coughs> How far you can cantilever with it, what loading it can take, what spans. There you can see it being used in a building. Another little staircase that we did, which is basically a spiral staircase that isn't spiral, it allows you to go straight. And, uh, and then swing around and go straight again. So you could use it continuously as a spiral. In fact, there's a mosque built here in Pretoria that used these all the way up in the, in the minaret. Uh, <coughs> and we can make them round as well. But in this case, it's, it's basically a 900 wide, 1,8 width of stairwell. <coughs> there you see it in my guest house in East London. This is from the parking lot going up into the building. And then wind deck, which is the pre-cast concrete flooring system. Another product of our company. There you see how it's been laid uh, with pigmented tiles. So you simply lay the beams, lay the tiles, joint it and polish it and you've got a finished floor. So that's very cost effective if it's used like that. If you're still going to put a topping over it and put extra finishes on it, it gets too expensive again. So it's lightweight <coughs> and simple. You can detach a seam on the underside by attaching a rendering, and we strap it there with stainless steel uh, straps and uh, that helps it from a fire point of view as well. So we have a half hour fire rating on that. You can increase your fire rating by putting a fire rated ceiling on the other side between different tenants. Half an hour is adequate within a, a, the same tenant situation. It works very really well in internal buildings. You can simply hand lay all these things. You don't have to have cranes on site. Very really simple to lay. This is part of the production, the moulds. So once again, having to design the whole production process, not only the product, but how, you, how do you produce it, how do you actually make it viable in the marketplace. <coughs> I then did a little house called the Wind Kit House, and we were speaking today about low-cost housing, and how
how to do the floor. And that is very interesting. In this case, we made a steel frame, which we nailed to the ground on long rods. And we slid, them up, slid the frame up until it was level. And then cast the concrete in that, in that space. And we left that frame there to attach the corner profiles on, so that they were exactly vertical, all with the block coursing marked. And in that way, we were able to generate the whole building off of that, basically it's a jig, a building in masonry, a steel jig that we did. <coughs> Everything done on the module of the uh, concrete masonry. There you'll see the steel posts on the corners. And I haven't shown you the, if I go back one, so that that steel frame trimmed that edge there and we thickened up the edge like that to handle the load of the masonry around the building. I had a client who wanted to do a big house with no money and so we, we used simple materials, concrete block and corrugated iron and gum poles. Gum poles round like that are cheaper than sawn timber. And they can do a lot of work for you and they're very versatile, so we use that. And that's the little building in East London, all on a very low budget. Um, so you'll notice here that I have a clay brick skirting. <coughs> so if you lay that clay brick, you don't have to put a skirting in the wood. Because it gives you something you can sweep against and it's dark and, and yeah, so it actually hides it. So once again, it's a cost-saving integration. <coughs> in the materials of the building. I had a partner who came into the business who was very much into the postmodern colours. You can see them coming through there. So Alan had an influence on what we were doing. And there you can see these uh, skirting at the floor level. We then did a building. Um, in East London, which won a national award, it's called the uh, Audio Video Gallery. It's a little building where they're selling high-end audio uh, systems, and uh, that became also in a postmodern sort of way. <coughs> we used the wooden blocks as screens. Because this is facing northwest. That's actually on northwest axis. That main. So that is really a screening device. <coughs> how am I doing for time? I'm just watching it. How far? How much have I got left? More than 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. This is an internal shot. This comes now to my guest house, Stratford's guest house, which is perhaps the most published work. And so what happened was that I. Um, I sold Windblock PDY Limited and I went walkabout, you might say, and designed this building. My eldest son was studying architecture and so Richard and I got involved in this thing and uh, designed this building. This is the existing house, that one that I showed you earlier on. And I had a, there was a house there which we demolished and we recycled a lot of that building into this building. So we had to accommodate the parking in terms of the town planning regulations underneath the building. So by lifting the building up and pushing the columns back to that line there, we ended up with quite a serious cantilever. The, the step back allowed us to let east and west light into the building on that back facade as well. So using the there's a two parking bays, each bay like that became the grid for the building. The existing house, the pool, and the north wing and the south wing. There's two north over there. And this is a little 40 seat lecture room at the one end of the building. <coughs> so here we used corrugated iron. So I have the biggest Zozo, you call it? What do you call it? <laughs> Zozo. Zozo in South Africa, or John Dollar, they would say in, in Durban, I think. Eh? If you're Zulu speaking, you'd probably say John Dollar. 
Ikuku is another word, eh? A little foul run, eh? <laughs> so there you see how the sheeting is attached there and along another line there and up at the roof. Now the roof is not stepped, it's a continuous line. And so each one is warping as it's going. You can see that, you know, it's, the ridge is, is running on a continuous line but the bottom is stepping as it's going. I did all the structural steel. My youngest son had just finished school, so Andrew went and learned how to measure twice and cut once and do all the steel work for this building. And there you see, I told you the story this morning about the South African Air Force taking me for a flip and the photographs that we took uh, on that building. So this is Andrew there. And they're, yeah, they are assembling these components for the building. And you'll notice that it's got a curve in it. Eh? And so this is also where I started to bond the glass onto the building and give it tempered glass to be bent over the building. For the shutting of the main building, we use flooring boards. So that left a very nice V joint on the underside of the shutting. And we could reuse those when we actually laid the floor just cleaned all the cement off, sanded them and varnished them. So it was a W. So I remember getting a quote for shuttering of about 40 odd thousand. I said, why must I spend money on shuttering when I can buy the floorboards and reuse them in the building? So that is what we did. So recycling the building materials as we went through on the, on the project. We didn't pump concrete. We had a crane and uh, just keeping ahead. This is the electrician over here. And just him keeping ahead of us of the concrete to make sure that we had all the conduits in. So getting towards the end of the project, here's all the gun poles. Once again, a very cost-effective way of doing the roof. This is all the shutting, the conduiting. And uh, no cranes on site, just manual labor. Picking things up. It can get quite heavy sometimes. Eh? Health and safety? No, we do. This is before we actually punctured through a very simple facade on the, on the south side of the building. And you're in Fazan, this is my wife, um, doing the gardening. Okay. And here you'll see the, the ridge frames with the gun poles, and this is the auditorium for the sloping floor. And this is my other son laying that flexible glass, bonding it on it, and you can see him standing on the glass here. Okay, it's actually scary. <laughs> uh, when it goes, it goes suddenly, and you fall very quickly. Uh, but it doesn't go that easily. But if you've got something sharp, it'll go. So you've got to, don't have a stone in the sole of your shoe because then you'll go through it. Okay, so be very careful. Don't stand on it like that. <laughs> anyway, he did it just to prove a point. <laughs> I designed all the furniture and this is the, the drawings for them. The headboards, the tables, the chairs, the dressing tables and so on. Um, I entered a competition for innovative technology um, for low-cost housing in Duncan Village, which is just outside of East London and developed all the components for the building and then had walk-ups, um, four-storey walk-up buildings on a modular basis and you, know, you just get some sort of understanding of the urban design. The next project is using uh, that tempered glass on a steel, sorry, on a gun pile and steel structure and uh, that was done with Archicad, not with Blender, okay? <laughs> and uh, there you can see how the glass panes are flexed over the support and the, and the corrugated iron is also flexed over the support. <coughs> These are the builders. These ladies, one or two men, did a fantastic job 
getting all these piles exactly correctly positioned and plumb. Um, I was there most of the time having fun with them. And there's always a dog around us to, as the foreman, and just to make sure we, we carry on working. <laughs> And uh, you can see that this timber is cut on a curve as well, so that it gave us then a the right profile when we laid the sheeting on that. Mm. These are the elements that we did out of re rebar and then galvanized steel, for bolting all the bits together. And those we had pre-made, brought them to site and bolted them onto the gun poles. This is me when I had black hair. <laughs> <laughs> so you get some sort of understanding of the scale of the building. It had amazing acoustic um, qualities. It also loaded glass that breathed because none of that glass touched. Everyone was separated from the other. So the air could get through. And we had little aluminium trims on the edge of the glass so the water wouldn't flow over the edges. It only flowed down. Unfortunately, that became a prize for vandals because you could steal aluminium by breaking the glass. So this building was in fact trashed. It doesn't, didn't survive. And uh, that is a sad thing to say, but it went. Um, and I, I said to the client, I said, don't build this building until you build all the buildings around the plaza, which they didn't do. Because if you got surveillance by other people, then they wouldn't have been able to come in and break it down. So this is a, a lesson learned in terms of development of, of township and, and, and housing complexes. Make sure you get surveillance by the, the users of the property of what you are doing. <coughs> so it looks something like a spaceship but it's not quite. And then I <coughs> did another little house where we introduced this precast concrete window system which we call the wind slot. Once again using the gun poles and had that all pre-made, the structure pre-made in the factory. And uh, this is the builder, owner builder. And uh, yeah, you can see these slotted windows. He had a few wind blocks in the building, but they were inside just for fun. <laughs> okay, we didn't have them on the outside of the building. And that's the little building. And mm -hmm. we caught all the rainwater and stored it in an underground tank here. So rainwater harvesting. And that's a view on the internal. Letting in a lot of north light into the building. Um, using the staircase to go up. This was a concrete floor that, which we screeded. The back of the building, we didn't build a retaining wall. When I excavated, I realized that we had very nice sandstone, which was easy to excavate. And instead of building a retaining wall, we created a gutter, internal gutter here. So that in winter when it, sorry, in summer when it rains, eh? because we're in a summer rainfall area, there's actually water seeping out through and running out of there. And what that does is it cools the whole space down tremendously. In winter, fortunately, it doesn't rain too much, otherwise you get too much cold in there. <laughs> but that, that worked quite well. Yeah, you can, you can see some of the wind blocks. We also did recesses in the concrete, which we cast little domes and then put the light fittings directly into there. So this is the wind slot system and all the different components to go around corners, how to lay them, some of the detailing, how the glazing fits in, how we bond it in. These are pre-stressed components. Some of the projects that we built, this is a new Technical College on the West Rand here somewhere. I, mean, I haven't been here. There you can see it going in load bearing. Uh, a bit of loads are coming down in these elements here. So these are guys, our guys actually fitting the glazing in this case and cleaning it all. This is up at Cullinan. It's the public library there. You can see how the brickwork is sitting on top of a slotted window. So they did this and they put the lively shelves in front of these panels. And there's light coming over the top and light coming underneath. Mm -hmm. This is a, an artist studio in Cape Town. This is Mangus City University of Technology on 
the stairwell. Yeah, you see it used. This is coming in once again. This is the art gallery. <coughs> Private home down at Jeffrey's Bay. These are the big guns uh, in South Africa back then. In terms of, um, this is Malcolm Campbell. He is head of SACA, president of SACA. Sue Lening, CEO of SIA. Martin Kunutza was the registrar. If you become an architect, you have to be registered. And then Trish Emmett uh, was the president of the South African Institute of Architects. And this is the day that I was inaugurated, standing in my glass dome building, as president of the local institute in East London. So I then got involved in the institute and I brought about uh, this little program of transformation, uh, trying to bring about change within the institute and bring it up to speed with the new South Africa as much as possible. And uh, that was a long process for me. I spent nine years in total being part of this uh, institute. I was followed by Fanyol Matsepe, who is uh, Patrice's brother, and then uh, the late Cindy Munyama, uh, who passed away only last year. And uh, together with Cindy, we then did the University of Forte in East London. It's a six-story building. And uh, it's also based on the parking bay grid. Three parking bays, 8.4 meter spans. And here you'll see some of the cross sections through the building. So the building was facing due north in this direction. So by using that north facade as a heat gaining facade to generate energy in the building to extract the air and ventilate the building. You'll notice that this building is at the moment being ventilated. Not air conditioned, I don't think. It's just ventilation can hear the sound of it going. So it's important to keep air changes going in uh, lecturing spaces. So this is a cross section through it. And uh, we read lining here just to make sure it was done properly. Mm -hmm. The drawings, and then we had planter boxes on the south facade made out of timber, in which we planted uh, vegetation to grow in these screens, so that the air coming into the building would come through a vegetable garden. Not actually quite vegetable; it was actually just a type of uh, vine that was growing. It could have been grapes, but not; it wasn't. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So the principle is that the air is drawn through in the floor, there are little um, ventilating panels in the floor tiles and hot air rises and it is displaced through a slot there. The heat on this external skin drives that air up and then wind blowing through that continuous ventilation slot running across the top of the building to allow the air to escape. So in that way the building was ventilated naturally, no energy used in ventilation except using natural energy, sunlight and wind. To do that we employed CSIR to do computational fluid dynamics. You can do that in a computer nowadays. If you design the building in 3D, you can then load it and see if it works from a fluid dynamics point of view. And so those are all the elements and the components of the building. These are Precast elements which captured the sunlight and they acted as chimneys in the building. So we had glazing at this face and that face to insulate. The back of these was insulated to stop the heat going into the building. And these are the components for the floors and the, and the structure. <coughs> so Bucky Fuller, who knows Bucky Fuller? You probably know the name, eh? Uh, American architect, engineer, he did the geodesic domes, very much into lightweight, and he asked Norman Foster, how much does your building weigh? And so with apologies to him, I asked myself that question as well. And we then employed an engineer to do the calculations on the carbon footprint of the building. And so we were able to reduce the carbon footprint by 33%, 48% less cement, and we were 41% lighter, the building was a lot lighter, and saving on the actual structure as well. <coughs> to prove that, I built a 1 in 10 model 
and this is it here. And then we got that smoke that you have at the disco, yeah? <laughs> and we put that in the back, and we had a fan over here, something blowing through there, and we put it in the sunlight, and that thing you can actually see there the smoke rising up. So that my engineer didn't like the thing because it wasn't. He had to go back to first principles. You couldn't just look up in the catalogue what, what air conditioner he was using. You had to go back to first principles and design it. And so that's why we built the model. <coughs> this is the uh, work that CSR did, how they did the analysis of the whole building. And there you see some of the images from the computational fluid dynamics. And this is the speed of the air rising up in this column going out of the building and drawing it through from this side and out that side. A lot of the work that I do is outside of the na national codes and the engineering codes and I have a very good engineer who loves to work with me and do tests and so we, we take the things to failure. So the issue here was if you put these holes through here, what shear would happen? So we put a big jack under here and we load it until it fails and that way we knew how far we could go with the system and what we had to do in terms of the reinforcing. So taking the product right through to failure, a uh, very important part of the whole process. <coughs> so the day came when I resigned as architect and Cindy and my list of partner continued on the project and I suddenly became a material supplier, which is like a conflict of interest, you understand that? So that's why I resigned. I couldn't be both. Okay. I had to do one or the other. So I had to very quickly jump around and produce the molds for this in a very short time and then get the production going. And this guy was an engineer that joined us. And uh, this is my son David who also learned a lot at that time. So here you can see now some of the components that we designed and are now being swung into place in the building. This is what we call the primary beam, which goes over the column. So the column goes up into this space. Here you can see four columns. Those primary beams and then the secondary beam going that way with all the holes in through which the air could flow. So the whole floor is ventilated. <coughs> Here you can see the precast concrete tom wall, as we call it glazed on the outside face, we bonded the glass directly onto the concrete, once again eliminating the need for substructures and doing tests on that as well. And uh, <coughs> so that then created the opportunity for the air to rise in the building and migrate up the top. So that is a completed picture of the building since then. And uh, these white are ordinary Venetian blinds which are in the cavity that you can shut out the light if you need to, like if you want to have a dark uh, lecturing space. So that's the University of Forty done in 2010. In terms of the mediation of the space, the staircases became, in my mind, the, the way in which students could interrelate. So we had this double volume of space, actually six stories high, with a staircase almost like snakes and ladders. So you, you could actually be on the landings and at the other levels. So it gave a mediation space within the building for the students to be able to relate. It's not a building you get lost in very easily. Okay. So it, it's pretty logical in terms of how it actually works. <coughs> These are the auditoria, uh, 350 seats. And that's where the air is escaping. The hot air that's rising is escaping out of that line. And it's entering along that, that level there. These are the planter boxes of some of the plants starting to grow. And to stop the wind bashing it, we put in perforated aluminium screens on the outside. Otherwise, the wind would just kill it. And this is on ordinary diamond mesh uh, screens that we hung from galvanized steel rods. And we harvested the rainwater to water the plants and to also for the, uh, for the toilet uh, 
flushing of the toilets. It's a better shot, the plants have got growing. And uh, here you'll see the ventilation apertures in the floor, which allow the air to come through. They were cast into the floor tile. And there is the slot where the air goes out. One thing about the building is we didn't, I wanted to put in a flap on that to be able to regulate it. And the client said, no, leave it open all the time. So the building is ventilating very well all the time. It can get quite cold because there's no heating. We could have in fact reversed the air in that trombo and pumped that warm air back in. And it was an option, but they didn't go for it. Saving money and saving long-term um, running costs on the building. So that is the south facade, here you see the rainwater tanks harvesting the water. And this is the perforated metal screens which stops the wind blowing the plants to pieces. Nighttime shot. The stairwells and the lift wells actually anchored the building structurally as well. So that was in situ pause in those cases. That's the perforated aluminum screens. Basically it's a standard corrugated iron profile full of holes. Uh, at the same time, my son Andrew wanted a house and so we bought a site and we built a house for him. Another Zozo, concrete block and tin and wind deck and wind slot. So using the products, there it is. An owner builder operation. Um, corrugated iron again. And I've invented a gutter which works very nicely. <coughs> it simply clips over the end of the corrugated iron. It's a piece of galvanized steel, that shape. And you rivet it on top of the corrugated iron so that the water can still go in the corrugations, mm -hmm. go into it. So that's the type of gutter that we use in this building. And we're able, <coughs> able to harvest the uh, water. That's my daughter-in-law and my grandchildren playing outside through the windslot windows. There you see it left in its concrete masonry, no plaster, no paint, no money spent, no maintenance in the future. So really holding the costs. A little bit of colour introduced there for fun. We had to go for red and grey. It is the fashion, isn't it? <laughs> so somewhere along the line we had to have that. And uh, there you see that gutter clipping over the edge. And down pipes coming down and feeding uh, Jojo tanks that now stand in that space. This is a little project done by my eldest son Richard, and we did the production of the components. This is up at Stutterheim, and uh, we built a model of it. And uh, my engineer and his son, this is his son, built this. It's called the Shire. Uh, I don't know where that name comes from. And that's what it looks like. And that's Hamish Scott, the engineer. And all hand built, just out of uh, 38 by 150 timber. You can see that running there. We also bent glass into it as well. Made a little model. We also made a frame to put on the floor around which the timber was bent. That's how we actually built it. So we put a frame in there and we call it the Trojan, <coughs> the Trojan horse, you know what that is, eh? Put the Trojan horse inside there and then bent the timber over that. <coughs> to keep the right shape all the time. <coughs> Showed you this this morning. <coughs> we have these white baboons down in the Eastern Cape. <coughs> They have hairy arms. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. That's how that flexes. <clears throat> and that's the uh, Designing Dove Award that I got for this in 2013. And I showed you the furniture early on. Flat pack furniture and then some of the prototype models that we built uh, using the mannequin and full scale prototypes. This is the bent glass on the framework for the little building called, not the Shire, this one is called the Lantern. It's that building. 
that's the hairy bearded eldest son of mine, he's now 50 years old, he's an architect for his sins, and uh, Richard designed and built that building. Uh, he built it first in a factory, then took it to site and, and reassembled it, just to make sure that it all fitted together. And there you can see the, the roof is glass. We covered that with uh, vegetation, and then to let light through, you can see that's ve vegetation over there, to let light through, we took motor car tires and turned them inside out, and made round holes through the vegetation. I think that'll show later on. There you can see it there. It's a motor car tire, you can see the tread on it. And if you look up, you can actually see the roots of the plants through the glass. So it's actually quite a, an interesting organic type of, of space. <coughs> it's a cold climate there in the Hogsback, and so there were two fireplaces put into the building, one at the lower level, and then one at the next level, and this is the chimney. And uh, Norman Foster had just done a building in London called the Shard, and so this chimney is a Shard. <laughs> okay, so you can see it, the smoke coming out. <coughs> you always have to have the dog um, to give you some scale to the building. And that's the little building. I think this is a very good quote. I was doing the Sophia Gray Memorial Lecture and I came across Eileen Gray in my research. Very well known architect designer. Uh, she teamed up with an architect and built this house down on the south, uh, on the Mediterranean. And Corb went into that house and then disfigured it with his um, uh, murals on the wall. And then he was run over by a motorboat while he was swimming. Did anybody know that? And that's what he looked like. Eh? That's where the propeller got him. Eh? How painful is that? Serious injury. And a few years later, he died swimming at the same place, uh, at 65 years old. <coughs> so that's cool. I'll take you now across to America. This is Windblock in America, done by Frank Lloyd Wright before me. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I didn't know about this. And so later on, with the, with the internet and access to everything, I came across these buildings. So I said earlier on, you must look out for that building, the interior of mine and the interior, very similar type of space. This is one of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings. And uh, since then I've developed, busy developing a new system, and this is in precast concrete, but we're now doing it in timber, and I'll tell you about that tomorrow. But this is a full-on way of building buildings, walls, roofs, floors, everything. All done in timber, this is showing it in concrete. And this is perhaps one of the last major projects using Windblock here in South Africa. This is the new university at Nelspruit, Kumalanga, done by uh, ladies here in Johannesburg. I can't think of their names right now. So I'm a bit of a blank on that. And there they've used the wind grid, as we call it. And these are clay terracotta tiles that have been bonded into it. Very nice expression in terms of what it is doing in that building. So I'm going to, as they leave the building, I'm going to close and let us leave the building as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Al, for you know, taking us through a journey in your work and gives one uh, good perspective of how Creativeness has manifested on a different scale from building scale to the detailing of smaller parts of the buildings. Yeah, yeah. I think I really enjoyed mm -hmm. the talk. And I think if, you've worked, if you were there in the morning, you can build up quite a lot yes, on, yes. on mm -hmm. giving us more details on some of the work that you yeah. showed earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to say something, but I wanted to open for questions. Who of you were here this morning? I'm asking you a question. Okay, so you don't, those that asked the question this morning don't have to repeat it. Okay. 
Does anybody else yet for your questions? Yes. <coughs> bounced off of it because it's like it's like the side windows in your motor car it takes a lot to break it okay so but you've got a sharp point if you take you know the old story you take a spark plug you smash the, sh the side window of the motor car and you can get in easily with that a sharp hard instrument so something sharp will, will break that outside skin or tempered glass so, but it's fine with hail up to a point obviously it depends on the size of the hail there was another question. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, firstly, I did this building as a precedent last year, and I did not know that uh, that was a wind block like skin system. Mm -hmm. So, it's really good to find that out. Okay. And then secondly, with uh, wind deck. So, mm -hmm. my question is so now we don't necessarily have a slab, so the slab uh, is the tile. So my question is, what is the tile made of, and um, how how far how, how far out can the wind deck uh, span? Yeah, okay. yeah. And what do you do in terms of the joints for the tiles? Okay. Yeah. Right. And so I'll, I'll answer your question starting with the tile first. Let me let me go to the structure. Okay. So we designed those pre-stress beams to span up to six meters with a domestic load. Okay, domestic load being 150 kilograms per square meter. And that's like 280 kilogram people standing every square meter. Okay, which is quite a lot. So the beams carry the main load. The tiles have to span from one beam to the other. Yeah. Otherwise they'll just do that and collapse. So those tiles are, have a reinforcing mesh in them. Okay, we also cast into those tiles a light box, some conduits, so you can then drop in electrical cables in the joints before you grab the joints. So we lay the beams, lay the tiles on a water joint to make sure they're level, and then grout it with a tile adhesive. And that is slightly flexible. So it allows the whole thing, it doesn't crack anywhere, it cracks everywhere. Can you understand what I'm saying? There's tiny little cracks, you can't even see them. And so in that way, the, the expansion and contraction is handled within all the little tiles. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you concentrate, and I was just looking at this over here, you can see on this building over here, there's an expansion joint that is actually tearing apart, because all the expansion is, is concentrated, that whole concrete against that, then you get a control joint that will actually go. But if you can spread all your joints throughout mm -hmm. the piece, then you don't have that problem. You can also cantilever with those, with those uh, as long as we catch the end of them, because you can understand if you put a load on one, mm -hmm. that can break. But if you can tie them together at the end, so if you have a balcony, we tie them together with a steel channel, which forms the handrail, and in that way they hold together. So if you load that, it transfers mm -hmm. to the other ones. So we can span up to 6 meters uh, with the 250 deep one. We make it in 250 and in 170, those are brick coursing. 2 times 85 gives you 170, 3 times 85 gives you 255. Okay. <coughs> I want to ask you about the, um, the glass that's curved. Yes. The morning you mentioned it is cold treated. Cold Think bent. Yeah, yeah cold bent. I need to have a piece here. The cell phones have that type of glass in them. Right? It's actually pretty flexible because it is tensioned on both faces by that heating process. It's heated and then suddenly cooled, and that puts tension into the outside. 
So if you take the side window in your motor car and you wind it partly down, you grab it, you can actually flex it. Okay. If you do it a lot more, it'll break. And it only breaks, so uh, we did tests with it. Um, on a, we can take it up to about a two and a half meter radius. In other words, a five meter diameter round thing. That building that, that Richard did was nine meters diameter. And so we were working, it's a four and a half meter radius, but we've, cut, we've done it at two and a half meter radius. Uh, so it actually can bend quite a lot. So I had some test samples like that, and then a guy came with a mower and a little stone cannon. And one stone just took it out, eh? Very easily. Sharp stone from a mower, bang, gone. So it's, it can't handle impact loading, especially when you're flexing it like that. So when my son stood in it, like it, it's a bit dangerous, okay? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? No, please go first. Uh, I'm just going to the glass on um, the roof, like white glass. Why not like white bubble and sheeting, plastic, like those type of things? I'm back into here, I have to um, look read a bit. Yeah, it's into the glass, um, the it's curved glass, why not polycarbonate sheeting? Um, was it just to kind of experiment the, the limitations of the glasses or? In terms of the size? Uh, just the glass in general for the roof, like why not polycarbonate plastic? No, those, plastic. Yeah. Polycarbonate um, is very flexible, it's a lot more expensive and its coefficient of expansion is very high. So if you use polycarbonate, it, it expands and contracts and then all your seals go. So tempered glass is the go-to material in terms of uh, that type of roof. The cold bending is it's, in other words, you bend it when it's cold, it's not, not heated to, to bend it. So it means that with normal temperatures you can bend it. They've even made springboards for swimming pools out of that stuff. Okay. It is very, very flexible. So you must Google cold bending of glass and you'll see it there. It's basically, um, I think, I'm just trying to think of the architects that have done it, but there's a station in Delft that's been done with it. So there's a number of buildings that have been done with that. So what happened in that case, I, I went to Pilkington and I said, guys, this is what I want to do. They said, not on, it doesn't work. And so I took a piece and I bent it, put, put two concrete blocks and bent it with load and left it for months and nothing happened. I said, okay, fine, it seems to be fine. And I bought 3,000 rands worth of stuff and did my first little roof. And I've carried on doing it since then. So do we have... We have a question here. Have another one, and then we can round up. Mm -hmm. okay. How long does that? Um, I forgot what the glue is made of. The one where you bond the glass to the concrete. Yeah. How long does that last? How long does that last? Mm -hmm. Well, it lasts long enough for us to do a building like diagonal street building in Johannesburg. That was done in 1982. It's still there bonds on very well. Uh, we have to, but in that case it wasn't bonded to concrete, it was bonded to an aluminium substructure. The concrete, has, you have to make sure that your surfaces, as I spoke this morning, the surfaces are adequately prepared, otherwise you could get a delamination of the skin of the concrete. But it's, it's a very strong material for a very long time. You can see it actually coming loose here. Mm. Depends on the sure hardness of the material. Some of it gets too hard and can't flex enough, so you've got to use the right material as well to be able to handle the, the expansion. Okay. Uh, okay, the last question. It's, I saw everything that all your products, I saw SABS approved. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we had a class where we were asking about Agrima and SABS, mm -hmm. and we were told that uh, SABS is, just takes too long and it's just too expensive. Uh, in your experience, uh, is it worth it? Or is can it's agreement just a quicker route to, to go? Yeah, it's a deep question because there's actually, the national building regulations were made in 1984. Prior to 1984, each municipality had a different set of 
building regulations. And so South Africa tried to standardize building by promulgating the national building regulations. The national building regulations are basically an act of parliament. <coughs> How you comply with those regulations is by SANS 10400, which is the deem to satisfy. Mm -hmm. So if you do buildings in, in relation to SANS 10400, you're deemed to satisfy the Act. Mm -hmm. However, what that means is you then have to stick with existing materials. Mm -hmm. Or you can do what is called a rational design. And a rational design is when you bring in an engineer, an expert in the field. And that's why I have people like Alan Jones to stand there and watch us do those tests. So we have an engineer signing off on the tests. So you, you don't have to go to the Agrimar certificate. I went the Agrimar certificate at one stage. It cost me a lot of money. It took a long time. And the product that I invented didn't work. <laughs> okay, I have, I've had lots of failures as well. You can't get somewhere without having some failures. You learn by that, okay? And uh, it didn't work because of tolerance and because of the production system. Mm -hmm. But I spent the money on the Agamon board. The same with patents. You can have all sorts of ideas and things. You can spend the money. It's better to spend your time on the engineer and on marketing to get the product going than to go through these routes. So, but the, that little house that I did, I called it the Winkit House. I had a client who wanted to build a little house in the township for his maid. And I submitted plans to, to the East London Municipality and they wouldn't pass them. They said that this does not comply with SANS 10400 in terms of the space inside the upstairs rooms. Uh, then, in those days, I used the fax. I faxed the, the plans through to the Southern Bureau of Standards and they said, take them to court. I said, I can't afford to do that. I said, no, you can. It's 100 Rand plus that, <laughs> which I could afford. Okay. And so the day came when we went down. There's a special court that has been set up by the Southern Bureau of Standards to make sure that local municipalities, in fact, do comply with the national building regulations. So we went to court and uh, we had the chief city architect and the chief building inspector on the other side of the team. I sat there with my partner who was an architect. And uh, <coughs> we put our story and uh, I'd also gone ahead and built the building, which you're not allowed to do. They, give you, they gave me one month to demolish the building. I said, I won't demolish it, I'll take you to court. So the judge then came and said, Naughty boy, you shouldn't have built the building. However, you are right. <laughs> so nothing wrong with what you've done. So the building inspector said, you mean to say we can build this in Bunkers Hill? Now Bunkers Hill is the elite part of our city. And they said, you can build this anywhere in South Africa. Because it does comply through a rational design uh, process. So, yeah. All right. Thank you for those questions. I think it made it to be a conversation and which is a monument. So I appreciate all those questions. Mm. But yeah, we have to let you go. Thank you. So that you hear for our last session tomorrow morning to wrap it up. But thank you all. Thank you. Uh, just another thank you for the question, I appreciate it. All right. But thank you. This has come to an end of our session today. Thanks. Thank you.